State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Yamamoto. Um, Mrs. Yamamoto. Here. Ms. Radford. Here. Ms. Hendricks. Here. Ms. Kiga. Here. And for um, State Treasurer Ma, Mr. Saha. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Item one is the approval of the committee agenda. Ms. Hendricks. I uh, move approval of the agenda with flexibility. Is there a second? Second. Without objection, the committee agenda is approved. Item two is information, items, uh, opportunities for statements of the public. We have members of the public who are here to address the board. We have 30 minutes for public comments. Uh, we'll begin with Ms. Fosberg. Jane Fosberg. I'll ask the staff to be sure that the uh, timing is on. Gentlemen in the back, make sure that's taken care of. Thank you. Ms. Fosberg, good morning. You have two minutes to address the board. Is it on? Yeah, okay. Um, my comment is mainly for this year's new board members. And by the way, congratulations. Um, let me give you some background information on Fossil Free California's involvement with the board that might give you some understanding of any apparent impatience and frustration on our part. Fossil Free California representatives have politely made public comment at CalSTRS Investment Committee meetings for the last six years. Six years ago, we quoted Beavis Longstreth, former commissioner to the SEC. He warned that fossil fuel investments were risky investments. He said that fiduciaries were justified in divesting from them for financial reasons alone. He also warned that engaging with fossil fuel companies in the hope that they would change their business model would be futile. In his presentation to the board, Al Gore echoed the futility of engaging with fossil fuel companies. His experience of engaging with them for decades had not been productive. He said that some companies would seem to be taking action, or at least promise to take action, and then renege on their promise and backslide. And here we are, six years later, learning the hard way that fossil fuel investments have indeed been risky investments. For while staff continue to engage with fossil fuel companies, and while the world witnesses more unprecedented fires and floods, our investments in those companies cost our pension at least $5.5 billion in profit. Board members, Please recognize that the fossil fuel era is ending. Peak demand for the industry has begun. And as Alicia Steiger warned at the offsite meeting in October, any cost of getting out too soon is better than the cost of getting out too late. We urge you to follow New York City's example and completely divest CalSTRS of its fossil fuel investments by 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Amin Abdi. Three minutes. Good morning. Sorry. My name is Amin Abdi. Um, and I'm a high school student. I'm 18 years old. And I'm not attending school today because I think some aspect of what these kids are saying should be recorded. They've been coming to you every meeting since May asking you to divest from fossil fuels that's destroying their future. And I'm here today to represent these kids. And would like to invite you for a couple of things. First of all, talk with us today and ask these kids and have an honest conversation on why they think that investing in fossil fuels is such a terrible thing. Let us celebrate you publicly in the press on our global network. For those of you who are ready to be on the right side of history, we have cameras prepared to document you saying that, you know, the time for engaging fossil fuel companies has long passed. Tell your members and the public who we are. Most of these kids are being labeled as environmentalists simply, but these are kids as young, as young as 10 years old and college students that are asking you to divest. And the last thing that we invite you to do is Put divestment on the agenda, please, so that it's discussed in your next meeting. 
We do not understand how you keep saying that you believe in the science of climate change, but are not willing to take and make properly examine all your options. Thank you. Hannah De La Cal, two minutes. Hi, my name is Hannah De La Calle, and I'm a 20-year-old UC Davis student. I've been here twice now to ask you to divest from fossil fuels. Last time, I told you about my heart-wrenching truth, which is that no matter how hard I work, I'm not going to be able to make a difference in my field until it's too late. And that's why I'm here again today, to ask you to divest and to skip away from my studies in order to do that. You may not see how your actions here have anything to do with the climate crisis. The billions of dollars you work with and the many different uh, investments that you have to make, it's not surprising that it's hard to lose sight behind all the face values. After all, there is a lot at stake. This pension fund is supposed to hold up thousands of teachers for their retirement and to support them all the way through. So you do have to make very smart investments. But yet at the same time, this pension fund is the only option that teachers have. They don't have social security and they can't open up 401ks. No matter how dirty the money is, they have to accept the money that you're giving them. But I don't have to tell you this because they're already here begging you to see the reality of the situation we're in. The climate cr crisis has given every single one of us a choice. We either stay in the sinking ship without even trying to fix it, or we actually do something and everything in our power to plug up the holes and get the water out of the ship. And some of us have more powers than others to do something. So I'm asking you now, to choose our future, and to invest in a green future. Thank you. Thank you. Costanza Gonzalo. Okay, sorry. Um, we'd like to request that the um, Youth versus Apocalypse go now, because they've got to go to the Capitol to be in the march. So if they can go next, the next four people. Would that be okay, Harry? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Ramirez. So this is, uh, we have Carrie Ramirez, uh, Car Carrie Ramirez, Dolce Arias, Irina Saldana, Carolyn Noor. Yes. Okay. Carrie Ramirez. Hello, my name is Dulce, and I'm going to be reading a testimony of youth who are minors who are not allowed to be recorded in this meeting. Thanks. Hello, my name is Sue Haith, and I am an 11-year-old. I go to Urban Promise Academy, and I am in the sixth grade. Today, I want to talk about the policy of engagement. You have told us that you don't believe in divestment because it is not important.
Promise Academy. I've been going to board meetings for the past nine months in the hope that you to in hope for you to divest from fossil fuels. I wanted to be here today in person, but I have a science and math test to take, so I made this message ahead of time. According to your divestment policy, no further action will be taken until all efforts of engagement have been fully exhausted. But what is more exhausting than carbon emissions rising faster and faster each year? I'm lost in deep thoughts on why rising carbon emissions isn't enough to understand that divestment on fossil fuels is and on fossil fuels is extremely important. Aside from devastating forest fire, fires, fossil fuels isn't going to help the situation. I know every board member here knows that you, con that you continuing, continue investing on what's contributing to the destruction of our planet. Sharon, from the board meeting we had on January 16th, it seemed as though you wanted to say something, but it was, it was if there was something that stopped you from doing so. Whatever that thing is stopping you, you listen to what you think is right for the future of us youth, for your family, for future generations, and not just to an investment strategy that will eventually be pointless if our planet is on fire. Finally, by investing in fossil fuel industries, you are contributing to the fact that the vast majority of the money we give fossil fuel industries are literally spent on the destruction of our future. Of the $6 billion you invest in them, only 1% is spent on renewable energy. It is time to try something new and to give us a chance. So this is from Ajane, a 14-year-old. He says, hi, my name is Ajane. I'm 14 years old, and I couldn't say this to you guys because you only record 18 plus. Oops. Um, you say that you are engaging in fossil fuel companies, but since the world is still getting hotter and the ice is still melting, we can tell it's not making the change you need. You can engage with Starbucks and ask them to use paper straws, but you can't engage with a fossil fuel company and make them get off fossil fuels. Hello, this is another testimony. Your, what is your name? Dulce. Dulce, okay, Dulce, thank okay. you. Hello, my name is Angelica, and I am currently 15 years old. To get straight to the point, we want Callisters to divest in fossil fuels, from fossil fuels. Not just me who wants this, but teacher, the youth, and other communities. <laughs> Science tells us that every gallon of fossil fuel that is burnt hurts people and animals and threatens to push us past the tipping point where we can't go back. Our house is on fire, and you are rewarding the people throwing gas on the flames. Our house is on fire, and you need to act like it. Don't stand with fossil fuel companies. Stand with the students. My name is Carrie Ramirez. I'm 18 years old. Carrie Ramirez? I'm speaking for Aiden, who is 13 years old. He's in eighth grade from the Fruitvale District in Oakland. You've met me multiple times at Calster board meetings, and I wrote this to deliver my message. Why, Why is investing, investing in fossils fossil fuels a good, good choice? Issues? Why is divestment not a good strategy? Your job is to prioritize teachers and to make sure that they have money for their retirement. But your most important duty is to care for human beings. Teachers are human. Students are human. You are human, yet, you, yet your actions show otherwise. Investment is immoral. You have heard the same things over and over. Have you really registered the fact that your investments are contributing to the destruction of our planet? When you met with us, you said your number one duty is to get money for teachers' retirements. But investing in fossil fuels doesn't even get you that much money in the first place. You make it seem as though you don't have a lot of power, but you do just by being on the board, and your actions are immoral. I would have preferred to say this in person, but not only do I have a math test, you just wouldn't record me to say it myself anyways. Money plays no part in a future that is on fire. to testify who is under 18. Do you want him to go now or do you want him to go after? No, we can, is that Ramori Kash? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we'll just turn the uh, recording off here in the auditorium, please.
Mishwa Lee. Going. That's Mishwa's right. What is your name? Freya Moore Johnson. Freya, do we have you on the list? Did you sign up? Yes. Okay, why don't you continue? Go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Um, good morning. My name is Freya Mar Johnson. I am a college student at UC Davis. Um, sorry. Um, this is my second time speaking here um, in this setting, and um, I wanted to tell you a, hyp a hypothetical story or part of a hypothetical story that um, might well happen should this team not decide to... Um, to divest six billion dollars from fossil fuels. <clears throat> Again, like I said last time, I'm not telling anyone how to do their job. I'm just exercising my right to, to speak in this setting. Um, a young college student such as myself or my colleagues skips class over and over again to attend meetings and rallies to protect the environment, knowing that it might be irresponsible. <sighs> she graduates and continues fighting to preserve the air she breathes, the water she drinks, and the humanity with which she exists. Ultimately, however, it is in vain. Our efforts alone are not enough. We need you to cooperate with us, please. <laughs> Ultimately, Sacramento floods, a heat wave occurs, a drought, who knows? And within five years, any of this could happen. Lives could be lost. My life, anyone's life. Like so many people my age, I am considering not having a family. Seriously, considering not having a family. And the more I think about it as I grow older and start thinking about these kinds of things, it's heartbreaking. The notion that my right to have a child should be taken away from me because children produce so much carbon um, because ultimately if I had a child it wouldn't have clean air to breathe um, and within this story um, I'm 50 years old and the temperature has risen by 3 degrees Celsius which is against the Paris Climate Accord <coughs> um, thank you and um, my friend will give the second part of the story and you just I thank you Freya your next, the next guest is your name please Hi, my, can I have a picture? my name is Costanza, and I'm also from Sunrise Davis, and I'm a UC Davis student graduating this year, and I want to continue that story, but on a different scenario, so if we actually divested from fossil fuels and invested in a green economy, which is what is coming, and I am hopeful, and I am certain that that is what the next 10 years, 20 years is going to look like. It's going to look like investing in our public transportation, electric cars, just super cool. I'm able to breathe. I'm able to drink water no matter my income. That's just, that's, that sounds so low in my standards, but it is. And I think it's important to know that it is possible and it's possible if everybody puts their grain of sand in this. And I don't want to continue missing my life because I am constantly fighting for this. And I am constantly at these meetings, at rallies, at things like that, because this is the future. And I am hopeful. I am hopeful that we can invest in better technologies, which exist, which exist. There's a bunch of foundations, a bunch of organizations that have so much better future. And they're not, they're not lies, they're there. Like sequestering carbon and making limestone, making construction materials. It's the reality of our economy and it's going to change and it's better if California takes the first step to do that. We have a strong history of environmental action and we shouldn't stop today. Thank you. Thanks, Costanza. Um, Karen Perkins. Um, I would like to request permission to sit before my comment starts. So and what is your name, ma'am? Emily Bine Emily. with Sunrise Movement. Okay, Emily, Sacramento. why don't you start? Okay. Can 
may I sit? Yeah, sure. Okay. You want to sit down for your comments? Yes, Of please. course. Thank you. Two minutes, Emily. All right. Hi. I am Emily Bine, and I'm a member of Sunrise Movement Sacramento and also speaking behalf on three teachers who could not be today, here today and one past Calster's worker who couldn't be here today. Cyclone Babul, millions displaced, around 20 dead. Iranian floods, half a million displaced, around 70 dead. Cyclone Idi, three million affected, two billion in damages rampant disease after. Mozambique alone, millions in urgent need. Months later, 1,005 confirmed dead. Australia, estimated $2 billion in damages. Over 3,000 homes, ecosystems destroyed. Two times yearly carbon output, 1 billion animals, more than 30 people dead, still on fire. Here, we know fires too. Only a glimpse of 2019, this is under 1.5 Celsius of warming, dictated both by the IPCC report and the UN, not even at 1.5. Two degrees is too late. I am tired of being angry. What is beneath that is grief and fear. But without furious hope, I would be at home recovering from my failing health for months. Perhaps that communicates something. I hope so. Five billion dollars would have been accrued through divesting years ago. And money is a motivator, but not the only one. You may have people you love, places that you find beautiful. Your care may stretch far beyond that. We all like feeling safe and happy. Financial accruement does not necessitate fossil fuel investment. Even if it did, we are sacrificing safety, then happiness, then more. We decided what part you play in the small window is up to you. After your decision, notice how it feels. We will not stop. The world will not stop. The window will close. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Karan Hamilton. I'm Karen Perkins. Karen? I was next, um, but okay, that's Karen, fine. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Thanks, Karen. I, I um, Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Recent headlines, December 31st, 2019. Goldman Sachs follows global peers on fossil fuels and has made the decision not to invest in Arctic oil projects. January 14th, 2020. World's biggest investment firm, BlackRock, to shun fossil fuels as it steps up efforts to tackle climate change and calls for a, quote, fundamental reshaping of finance. January 16th, 2020, CNBC. Microsoft will go carbon negative by 2030. Do you see a trend here? You're worried about losing money for the fund, and I appreciate that. I'm a retired teacher. But the corporate night study shows you're already losing money, and trends show it's not going to get any better. A Manhattan equity attorney friend of mine said Goldman Sachs actually cares about the future when investing. You remind me of a young bird in a nest afraid to fly. A big cat is on a nearby branch, and the parents are saying, you can't stay here forever. You need to learn to fly. And besides, the tree is being chopped down. But the little bird is afraid to take the leap. The nest is comfortable, and it's all the bird has ever known. You, like the bird, need to take that leap. Get out of your comfort zone. You're afraid of losing money? You are losing money right now from fossil fuels. Divesting is going on all over the world. Not everything in life is gradual. Sometimes things happen very quick, rapidly. Don't be the last bird to jump and leave us with stranded assets. The expression that youth are our future is true. The future is here talking to you. They want action now, not just pretty words. So do we. Um, what to invest in? How about steel for windmills, materials for, other, for solar panels, electric charging stations and electric cars, bullet trains? Up your Thank you. When Greta Thunberg says fairy tales of eternal economic growth, she was wise beyond her years. Do you think that the economy will outlive the planet? We only have a few more years. Act now. Um, 
Karan Hamilton. Thanks, Karan. And then uh, David Bustamante after Karan. Thanks. My name is Curran Hamilton. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm part of Sunrise Sacramento. Um, I, I'm going to keep my comments short because there are many younger people who are more knowledgeable and more articulate. I'm just here to say that there are other groups, as the previous speaker mentioned, like uh, BlackRock, which manages $7 trillion or something like that. Um, so if they can do it, you guys can do it. Thanks. Dave, David Bustamante is our last speaker. Oh, man. Okay. Hi there, my name is David Bustamante. I'd first I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I'd like to thank everyone who already spoke before me uh, for doing so. It takes some kind of bravery to uh, do some public speaking, especially in a group of people that I probably don't know most of you. Um, anyway, I'll keep mine simple and short as well. Uh, we're here to ask you today to make the move away from the fossil fuel industry, including divestment, and based because of that support you're providing for them. That um, is a simple goal for us because really the future of the planet is at stake and not just the planet the future of everyone in this room behind me uh, Young or old right because I'm sure all of you have at least some young people you care about and I know that I'm sure while we're giving these comments at least the, the thought has crossed your mind about them and because of that, I'd like you to take, make the move away from the fossil fuel industry. I'm sure by now you're all tired of us speaking about this, but I, and I also think that most of you would likely agree that climate change is a real issue. And I'd like you to make the next step from agreeing with us to supporting and working with us. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. That, that can... Harry, there's one other speaker. You called her up earlier on, and she gave her time to the young people. Okay. So it's Maisha. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. And your first name again is? Um, my name is Mishwa. Okay, Lee. Mishwa. Last yeah, and you week. called me a little earlier. Yeah. So I'm Mishwa Lee, and I'm from stolen Ohlone Raimatush land of Yalamu, otherwise known as San Francisco. Um, I'm a retired SFUSD teacher. My entire pension is dependent on CalSTRS. And it really pains me that I am, I, I am living off of dirty money. And I wanna thank all the young people that are here, that are raising their voices, that are standing up, that are speaking for the other young people who are not, whose testimony is not allowed. You represent teachers. We work with youth. How can you not accept and really hear what they're saying to us. They're warning us. Our indigenous elders tell us, watch out for the next seven generations. We're lucky that we are even, you know, we can barely watch out for our own generation. Come on now. I'd like to see a show of hands from the board. How many of you have children or grandchildren? Yay, okay, a few of you. I'm sure that you all have young people that you're close to in some way or another, nieces, nephews. Think of them. I think of not only my children and grandchildren, but all the children that I've been so fortunate to work with. We need to hear their voices. And I really hope that you will take this to heart this is not just a fiduciary issue, it is a moral issue, and it's the moral issue of our time. Come on, step up. Mishra. Thank you. One, one last speaker, Loretta Tottenberg. Ms. Tottenberg? Of course. Go ahead, Whatever. Loretta. You have two minutes, Loretta. I'm Loretta Tottenberger, representing UTLA Retired, and myself. I need to welcome our new board member, Denise Bradford. <laughs> She's a kindergarten, kindergarten through 12th. I have been a kindergarten teacher. I taught 45 years. I respect a new person and she will be wonderful. That's my report about the new board member. Thank you, Ms. 
Loretta. Very comprehensive report. Very comprehensive report. Now, now I, now I really feel badly because I knew I had made a mistake about halfway through the public comments, and I hadn't welcomed Denise Bradford, and it wasn't even 10 a.m. I had already made a mistake. So, Denise, on behalf of the board, welcome. Thank We're you. so pleased that you've joined us. Um, Thank the public comment. Uh, I would like to point out to members of the public that ha are not familiar with this report. It's a substantive report about the material impact that CalSTRS is having on the issue of climate risk and the opportunities that also are presented to the transition to a low carbon economy. This issue is not new to CalSTRS. We're perceived and viewed in the world as a global leader on this issue. This document speaks to all of the work and achievements that CalSTRS has achieved to date on this critical issue to all of us. So if you're not familiar with this report, I strongly encourage you to get a copy and educate yourselves on it. In particular, on page 62, there's a quote about CalSTRS's view on the issue of divestment. So I would encourage you to also reference page 62 of this report that speaks to this issue. So uh, I want to thank our staff for the work on that. There's also a document on the power of engagement and our view on this issue as well. Uh, because there are, during public comments, a lot of things are stated. We don't refute them. We don't engage in a conversation. That does not mean that everything that is stated before us is actually factual about who we are at CalSTRS, and I, I would, would not like the public to not have a full view and the record to be clear about CalSTRS' view on the issue of climate risk and the transition to a low carbon economy. It's an issue that we dedicate a lot of human resources and financial resources to in this organization. We've done it for years and we will continue to do it going forward. With that, uh, we're going to move on to the rest of our agenda, uh, if we could. Item uh, three and four are both on consent. I'm going to take them off of consent because I believe item three is the approval of the minutes. And Karen Yamamoto, do you, I'm okay with you're okay? I actually do. Okay. I'm trying to add myself, though. I can't get, I can't get Yeah. Okay, here we go, Sharon. Sharon. Got it. Um, I, I had just gotten a, a note that on um, INV8, under the public comment section, uh, one of our colleagues from CFT mentioned that um, that first line where it says the committee heard from and there's names, um, that Mr. Dowdy, it says Ms., it's actually Mr. Dowdy. Um, so, um, but the comment was that he did not make comments calling for divestment. Um, he, so the comment was Dr. Dowdy commented on CalSTRS positive efforts to make investments with consideration of climate change. So, so he made a request to be pulled out of that and, and have his comments represented accurately. Okay, so did, did staff, could you amend, uh, make note to amend the uh, final minutes? We will do that. And if you need, do you, yeah, you got it? Got it, okay. thank you. Great. And if you need to uh, get clarity, you maybe speak to Mr. Dowdy directly so that his comments are accurately reflected. Will Any do. other amendments to the minutes? Okay, seeing none, without objection, the, the minutes as amended are approved. The other consent item is the investment policy and management plan revision. Uh, obviously, this speaks uh, in very general ways about the implementation of the new asset allocation, and the key takeaways are the, the number of years that it will take to make those decisions and make those moves, and given... Uh, the impact that they could have, not necessarily best for uh, public uh, discussion in detail. But I do think, uh, Gail, you had a question or a comment on f item four. Yeah, thank you very You're, much. Let me just, Gail Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I around the, I appreciate all the work that um, Chris, you and your team have done on the ALM, and I think we've We've moved a long way and really grateful to the board. Thank you. I, I still, I, I don't need to go into a lot of detail. I, I still think that the, the implementation and, and where we are and how we're gonna get there is an important question. And 
the thoughtfulness not only in terms of, of the, the sequencing it over a period of time, and I understand that, but also how you're going to build capacity. And I've been especially concerned around the issues of, of that very question in private equity, not only how we'll get to 13%, how we'll build capacity, and how we will and how we'll do that while working within the collaborative model and hopefully bring it in-house for partnerships and co-investment. So I, I think those are, if we could just make sure, I, I think we have an understanding, but that those are on the record and we can continue to make sure we're sort of tracking those issues. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just take a short five minute, we'll take a short five minute uh, break. Okay, and we'll, we'll start back in five minutes. So if you could just put a five minute timer on and we'll start in, in five minutes. Thank you. Back to the agenda. Item five is the sustainability investment and stewardship. Oh, item four. Okay, I apologize. So we are back to item four, um, which is on consent. Were there other questions that the committee had on item four. Um, St Steve McCourt and Mika Malone are here. Any comments that you want to raise about the item uh, in terms of the implementation? Uh, I, I would just highlight it's, it's consistent with past practice at, um, at CalSTRS and the, uh, the policy uh, will um, result in staff uh, coming back to the committee every six months to address the migration towards the new asset allocations. So we think that's a good way for the committee to be continu continually engaged in that process. Thank you. Mika, fine. Geraldine, any comments from staff on the item? It's pretty straightforward. Ex Correct. Great. We, we tried to have minimal changes just related to the ALM and the policy, so there shouldn't be any surprises there. Okay, so seeing none without objection, it's on consent. The item is approved. Thank you very much. So this now brings us to item five, the sustainability investment and stewardship strategies. Oh, thank you, Jane. Got a lot going on here. There is a comment. Uh, Deborah Sylvie from Fossil Free. Ms. Sylvie, three minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm a Calster's retiree, Deborah Sylvie, and a co-founder of Fossil you. Uh, sure. Now, this will be very short. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Sylvie. I'm a co-founder of Fossil Free California, and I know that over many years, CalSTRS has gained a reputation of being a trusted leader in raising awareness about climate change. That is absolutely true. And we know that CalSTRS was much earlier than most pension funds in calling out climate change as a financial risk. So we know there's been some public trust there. But... Public recognition of the danger of climate change is increasing more rapidly than CalSTRS' response to that danger. The youth that come into this meeting room represent a small fraction of the youth around the world, and their numbers, along with their adult allies, are growing. People are calling for an end to the money pipeline, going to climate damage, damaging fossil fuels. And as you know, even financial institutions like BlackRock, you keep hearing that, but it's there, are signaling a shift away from fossil fuel investments. So to continue having the public trust, CalSTRS needs to go beyond engagement with fossil fuel companies and get out of these risky fossil fuel investments now. Thank you. Thank you. No other public comments on item four. Brings us to item five. Kirsty Jenkinson and your team, would you come on up? Kirsty and I had an opportunity to chat earlier this morning. Um, there are, there's item 5A, item 5B, item 5C, and item 5D. We'll hear public comments after we go through each one of these A, B, C's, and D's, but we'll probably take these in two tranches, A and B, and then we'll go to C and D. So after B, we'll be looking to take some action. Kirsty, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be able to have um, an opportunity to address you on multiple topics, as you can see that we are hoping to cover 
today, both in the open session and then also in the closed session with you a little bit later as well. Um, I recognise that there are many um, pieces of materials in your documents. I recognise that they've got lots of scrolls through them and lots of kind of like track changes. So thanks for bearing with us as we try and navigate through these suggested edits that we're going to go through. Um, as Harry suggested, I'd like to take with my colleague Aisha Mastagni, um, the, her and I would like to go through items A and B. Um, they are closely linked together in terms of approving changes to both our program policy language and the annual stewardship plan, which sits within that program policy. So we're bundling those two together because we think it makes sense to, to navigate them all in one go. Um, before we sort of really sort of kick off, I wanted to orientate you. There's a lot of words on this slide, so forgive me for that. But this is the beehive of activities, as we call it, that to help us all orientate ourselves as we try and focus and have the most significant impact in terms of thinking about our sustainable investment activities. So you'll see this little hive quite a lot as we're talking, because we think it'll help us focus on the different elements of how we use the resources that we have within the Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies, or SIS team. Um, as you can see, we have a way that we can invest and allocate our capital to investments that deliver both financial performance and environmental, social and governance outcomes, both within the SIS portfolio and throughout the CalSTRS portfolio. We have our stewardship activities that really focus on how we influence the market around us. And we also have the way in which we manage those strategic relationships that allow us to be successful. So I'm going to keep bringing us back as we go through items at various points today and going forward to these ideas of, of how we orientate our activities. Because as we all know, prioritization and focus is absolutely critical to success. So today, we're actually going to dive into, in this item A and B, um, the extensive revisions that govern the whole of our activities across those three areas. And that is the CIS program policy and portfolio policy as well. Um, attachment two is where I would call um, you to look um, most as we're going through this, which is the marked up version of our policy for the changes that we are proposing um, for you today. And also Makita's supporting memo for those changes and the rationale behind it. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes trying to say what are we trying to accomplish with this particular part of the agenda. You'll recognise, obviously, that over the past year we have changed the name of the team <coughs> from corporate governance to CIS, and a lot of the nomenclature changes that you see in the policy are directly addressing those changes. So those are, are fairly simplistic, but of course they create quite a lot of red lines as you go through it. Um, the more substantive issues that we're going to be talking about is the policy reflecting the broadened scope of the team's activities. Traditionally, as you know, the heavy focus on corporate governance has now been extended really to enable us to amplify our efforts across both environmental issues and social issues that we believe will affect the long-term performance of the portfolio. So a number of changes reflect those changes as well. And then finally, and I think probably most important to our discussion today, is the changes to how we think about prioritizing our activities. Um, in a world where clearly there is increasing focus on the importance of environmental and social issues to long-term investment performance, but also the recognition that there are increasing um, aspirations for us to take action in certain areas. We believe it's really critical that us as staff and the board as well have a process and a system to help us prioritize and filter those priorities that we want to devote our impact and our time on and those where we need to recognize that they exist but we might not be best positioned to make them an investment and an engagement priority. So that's what we're going to talk through. We're going to spend a little bit of time in closed session on the portfolio piece um, that I'm very excited about later. But today we're going to stick with these policy pieces. Um, let me also orientate you, because I recognize that when we discussed a policy, our policy at the November meeting, and when I also, um, we, we talked about the stewardship plan, it can get, as we know, kind of complicated when you have a set of policies. This is a complex institution that we manage and, and are part of. And so this, what you see in front of you, is the hierarchy of our investment policies. Just the investment policy hierarchy, there's obviously other hierarchies about how we manage money and benchmarks, but I bring your attention to this just to know what we're talking about today, which is clearly there are a set of investment beliefs that we have. We'll be talking about another one that we're proposing shortly, but a number of ESG issues are factored into all elements of this um, policy hierarchy. We also have the investment policy and management plan, which has a particular 
attachment around our ESG risk policy. Where we're going to be focusing today is on that latter um, um, policy, the corporate governance, as was known, program and policy, we're seeking to call it the CIS policy. So hopefully that helps you sort of see what we're talking about. It sits above um, the other asset classes because we're not an asset class per se, but we are obviously focused across all activities of the portfolio. And I think that's really important as, as we have these discussions. So I'm going to hand over to Aisha, who's going to walk through a little bit of the details of what we hope that we'll be discussing today. Good morning, everyone. Aisha Mastagni, Portfolio Manager in Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies. Thank you, Kirsty. I want to make one note for the board uh, just before we continue. Um, Kirsty alluded to it. Um, attachment four is Makita's concurrence memo. It's not noted in the cover memo of the item, but it is included in your board materials, um, INV 118. So just Thank want you. to make sure everyone yep. was aware of that. Thank you, Aisha. All right. So um, as Kirsty said, there are a whole lot of red lines and marked up in this um, agenda item. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, I want everyone to sort of focus on what we're calling the program portion of the policy. If you recall, the, the formerly known as corporate governance program and investment policy is divided into basically three sections. Um, the program policy, which governs all of our stewardship activities, the securities litigation, which is highlighted for your information and is not up for discussion or review in um, this item. And lastly is the portfolio policy, which will be discussed <coughs> more in the closed session item. So as I said before, there are lots and lots of marks up, um, a lot of things due to changing the name, expanding corporate governance to reflect environmental, social, and governance issues, or referring to more our stewardship activities as opposed to just um, engagement. Um, but the substantive amendments are referenced here, and in section uh, page C3, which is actually the page in the policy, it, we reflect the new goals of the CIS team. Um, on C4, we reflect the expanded stewardship activities, and we brought in the language to reference other partner organizations. Historically, CII, the Council of Institutional Investors, and the International Corporate Governance Network had been our primary organizations. But as you know, um, we work with a variety of um, groups that now advance um, stewardship activities in the marketplace. And last but not least is the annual stewardship plan and uh, the prioritization that Kirsty referred to in regards to inbound engagement requests. So we're going to talk about um, this flow chart a little bit more in terms of the stewardship plan, but I think it's important to note that we do have a logic for <coughs> making this part of the policy and memorializing in the policy, because I think that's an important um, aspect. But as you know, because we're going to move into the stewardship plan, an important part of this flow chart is the priorities that are established by that plan. And then last but not least, um, I want to inform, you know, talk about the alignment with the strategic plan of the board. So this flow chart and that prioritization of those activities is aligned with the board's strategic plan. And so this accomplishes that one of the goals. All right. So since we're going to take item 5A and 5B together, but we're hoping at the end of this discussion that you will approve the proposed amendments to the CIS program and portfolio policy, and those are all the marked up revisions in attachment 2. We can have the next slide deck, if possible. Would we be able to have um, the slide deck for 5B, please? We'll move just straight into that. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. So for the purposes of this discussion, we're focusing on the stewardship activities of the beehive um, and partly we like using this beehive because I think it's important to know that stewardship 
While historically had been a lot about our proxy voting or the occasional shareholder proposal that um, we submitted, it now involves all of these activities because in order for us to do our jobs effectively, we have to have well-functioning, efficient markets. And so a lot of what I'm gonna go through right now, you have seen before, you saw at the November board meeting, or at least for most of you. <laughs> and um, I just wanna make the note that um, we developed these priorities based on these three points. One, is it relevant to the long-term performance of our portfolio? Secondly, do we have the capacity and is it an issue that we as shareholders or investors can influence? And last but not least, you know, can we deliver a measurable outcome from our activities? And so I'm not gonna go into the next few slides in too much detail. This is what you saw in November, and it refers to um, our engagement priorities for the upcoming year. Uh, I doubt that much of these will change over the short term uh, because we still have a lot of work to do here. But um, as we stated in November, corporate and market accountability, board effectiveness, low carbon transition, and responsible firearms. And like I said, I'm gonna skip really quickly through each one of these, but I want the board to understand that there are layers of detail underneath each one of these items. And our goal is that if the stewardship plan is approved by the board, that we would then create um, a live document that would live on our website that would be accessible by various stakeholders, interested parties, and our other investment peers. So while I'm not gonna go through these, I just think it's important that you know that the information is there and available. So corporate and market accountability, what do we mean by that? That has to do with all our various shareholder rights, audit integrity, and ESG disclosure. Lots of other detail here. Board effectiveness, what do we mean by that? Um, once again, it's shareholder rights, executive <coughs> compensation, human capital management, and diversity. The low carbon transition. This is everything we're doing in regards to our stewardship activities related to the low carbon transition, and that means influencing public policies and engaging with our current portfolio companies. And last but not least is our efforts in regards to responsible firearms practices, and that's our engagement with the manufacturers, retailers, and in regards to technology. So I'm gonna pick it back up from here, hopefully now having given you the landscape of where we're hoping the policy will go and the annual stewardship plan that is embedded within it. The piece that I think we need to spend a little bit more time on, we started having this discussion in November, was if we can agree that there are a set of priorities that we dedicate the significant part of the team's time to in an effort to create the greatest impact that we can. We recognize that obviously there are other requests that come our way from different parties. They may come from our fellow investors and they often do very frequently as I think we alluded to in November. As a large investor, many people want us to join their initiatives and part of their engagement plans. And, and we recognize as well that many stakeholders come to us and come to you as well to ask you to focus on their issues. And so we felt it was really helpful to have a framework that we can all agree on and sort of codify that allows us to say, well, how do we evaluate everything that doesn't directly fit into the priorities that are established in the annual stewardship plan? And how can we coalesce around a, a kind of an agreement of how we think about those areas? And very much relates back to the three kind of guiding lights that we have in determining the stewardship priorities. We think there are three questions, three assessments that we have to make when deciding how to spend our resources. And they are, what is the impact on the long-term performance of the fund? Do we as an investor have an ability to influence? And can we measure some outcomes as a result of that? The good news about this is that we do have tools to help us along those assessments. You know, things exist to help those sort of what seem pretty broad questions to help staff come to an analysis of what we think is something we should focus on and what are things we shouldn't <coughs> focus on. So what I'm gonna walk through very quickly is just how we can do that. And then we were hoping that we can come to a point where an inbound request comes to you, comes to us. We have a system that we can go through to determine do we respond? Do we not respond? And if we do respond, 
How much time and resources do we want to put into this effort and energy? And where do we think it'll actually have the impact on the long-term performance of the fund? So let's just quickly start with that first question about, well, how do you determine long-term relevance? It's, it's kind of, one could say, challenging, but actually I'd suggest that it, it isn't that hard. Um, there are tools that have been developed, not least over um, many years in the last couple of years, like the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, a set of standards that helps investors understand which issues are most important to which sector on across the environmental, social and governance spectrum. These have been getting a lot of traction right now. Many people have already referred to BlackRock's letter. BlackRock and, and us are part of the investor advisory group to SASB. BlackRock and State Street have very much put their weight behind SASB being a set of standards that is important for investors to understand materiality of issues to long-term performance. We think they are a great starting point for us in analyzing and understanding what long-term relevance means. We also have our homegrown ESG risk policy, which has guided the fund for many years and guided our decisions, which we can continue to draw on. And then we do have a sort of a broader sense of, as investors, we think about systemic risk, we think about idiosyncratic risk. And those are another lens that one can think about how an issue could affect the long-term performance of the portfolio. The second issue we showed with you again in terms of um, at November, do we have an ability to influence change? We are very privileged in the influence that we do have with companies and with markets. We have many tools at our disposals, but we don't have all the tools and all the um, uh, materials to solve every single problem, unfortunately, that the world is facing. So we need to recognize that fact and realize that when we do have an opportunity to influence, we do have certain tools, but not all of them. So we can look and decide, is this an issue that we think we can genuinely bring our influence to bear or is it not? And then the third element I would suggest is we have to be able to say that we can actually point to a demonstrable outcome. Here we've been doing it for many years in understanding has a company actually implemented a change to its process? Have a market participant changed their practices or have regulators responded to our concerns? Again, these are the questions that we can ask ourselves. Could we track an outcome that is related to these factors? And then, of course, once we've gone through those assessments, it gives us a much better guidance on how we should actually analyze and think about these issues and determine the tools and resources required. Now, I've put, sort of put out a process. I will say it's a little bit of art as well as science. I think we all recognize that. But at least this gives us a bit of a framing or, let's say, a canvas for the art to be better. I'll leave it there. I'm not good at art analogies. <laughs> um, so I'm going to um, sort of briefly ask now if... Um, Scott can come up and, and frame this a little bit further in some of the discussions that we've... In fact, Scott's right there. He'll do it from there, just to add to some of my thoughts. <clears throat> yes, that's great. And I, my name is Scott Chan. I'm the uh, Deputy Chief Investment Officer. And I'd also like to call Amy McDuffie up. And while she's coming up, I'll, I will frame this issue. In the sense that I, I, I credit the uh, Kirsty and the SIS team. I think they've done a wonderful job of setting criteria which which we can prioritize our engagement and, and filter them and determine how many resources, resources, what resources we should be using. But I would like to suggest that we take a, a more extensive or a broader uh, process to define what our roles are, what, what the board's roles are, what the board's vision is for this. And I would just say that over the last 24 months, we've, we've really been seeing a, a lot more intensity and, and a lot more frequent frequency for, for many of these uh, stakeholder engagement issues. And I think that we're a leader in the space, obviously, because de facto uh, we have all these issues surrounding us. But I think that we could even get to a, a higher level of leadership. And how we've done that in the past, I think, has really been, and what Chris suggested was to uh, talk with, bring Amy McDuffie in, is that we've followed a strategic planning framework. And so, Amy, I'd, I'd like to have you chat a little bit about that. Sure. Thank you, Amy McDuffie, Governance Consultant to the Board. Pleasure to see everybody today. It was great to actually talk with Scott and Kirsty and Aisha about how we can bring our specialties together and use a framework that leverages a very core competency of the board and of the staff, and that's strategic planning. That's been a process that's been used here for years that has effectively organized your resources around priorities that link to a future vision and consensus metrics of success that the board and staff agree to and collaborate on. So that was the idea is how do we bring more of a multi-year approach to this so that we can align resources and priorities in a way that everybody has a chance to contribute to set the role of the board in a way that's familiar to you as well as staff. 
Yeah, and I, I just draw an analogy from from an investment perspective. As we are are, are um, investing in our transactions, we have a really well oiled machine um, in terms of the roles, the visions, and the delegation of authority and, and so forth. But I think in this area, uh, the process hasn't been as well defined. But it, uh, I think that we have an opportunity here to to even take our leadership position to to a next level. And so as we've been brainstorming this between Kirsty and Amy, Chris and myself, we thought that we'd like to make a suggestion to have a facilitated session where uh, we could take a strategic planning format to, to the engagement process. I'd like uh, Steve and uh, Mika to just comment on this concept of us putting together a process that in place that would help us um, align our resources and clarify roles of the board, the staff, around these uh, stakeholder issues that are that come into the system and with the expectation that um, the intensity that we've seen the last few years will probably continue. Uh, Steve McCourt, uh, Makita Investment Group. Um, I guess short response is um, I think it's, it's forward looking and I, I, I think very organized and well you know, thought through. So I, I, I would certainly encourage the, the committee to to um, uh, to think of it in these terms. And I think staff's done a nice job of uh, providing an introduction to the um, the different uh, issues uh, that need to be dealt with. And I think the more coordination and planning around uh, around these things, uh, likely the better outcomes. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. I will um, finish up here on these items, but just recognizing that there has to be a feedback loop, I recognize, between staff and board. We obviously have a regular feedback loop <laughs> that exists already. Uh, we have multiple reporting forums that we can provide you updates through. Um, that's something we're constantly trying to enhance and improve. I show a few of them here. You alluded to the Green Initiative Task Force. We have our quarterly value of engagements. We recently published a big report on our diversity and investment management with the 10 and 22 that we send to you every other week as well in terms of, of how we think about activities. So I'm confident that we can get to a place where we are providing full transparency about the priorities that we're focused on and also the ongoing activities that we're responding to as they come in. And so I wanted to highlight that as well. And I just want to make one final note, because um, I think, Mr. Keeley, you've brought this up in the past about you know, articulating to the market where we've had those successes and being able to articulate those outcomes that we talked about. And I think the value of engagements is a great forum for us to communicate that not only to the board, but to the public. I, uh, I would um, put an exclamation point on that. I think a lot of the conversation uh, and the momentum around ESG, which has now made it into the mainstream business conversations almost on a daily basis, one of the difficulties that people are having, some people that are really, really bright, is clearly articulating what ESG is and why do investors care about it. And the, 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 the more we can fine tune our message and the impact around these issues that you're talking about, the, the, the greater impact we can have not only on, I think, the returns to the portfolio over the long term as long term shareholders, but we can add a great deal to the marketplace who's having a difficult time articulating what is ESG and why do investors care about it. Uh, so I think this is, is a nice uh, synergy that's naturally taking place. And I think Mr. Fink's letter certainly helped. Sure. So I guess we will, um, hoping then, I mean, this is just one element of the approvals, I, I suppose we're looking for what we really sort of put before you in those blending those two items is an approval of the actual priorities within the stewardship plan. Um, approve the framework, which we will put memorialize in policy for inbound engagement requests, approve the policy language that pulls all of this together. And then as we sort of touched on as well by Amy and Scott and, and, and Stephen's um, interventions about looking forward to a process that helps to kind of build this into the, the strategic plan. So Mr. Chair, I think those are the four points that are, we're trying to sort of put at these, this stage. So let me open up to questions or comments by the committee. Sharon? I just had a question, Mr. Chair, about the, the process and the strategic planning. Is that something we'll talk about again in subsequent meetings in terms of what that would look like for 
the board conversation? And yeah, so uh, Scott and I have communicated about this a bit. We'll certainly bring Joy into the conversation as well as to the appropriate time to agendize this yeah. so we can have a structured conversation so that each board member can have buy-in and have a say in terms of what the process will be. We're not exactly sure as to which agenda it will be, but we'll, we'll talk about where it would fit best. And then working with Amy McDuffie to help us with that and, of course, have Makita weigh in as well. So we're just kind of approving the general concept that we want to move in that direction right. and then Correct. we'll get more details. Great. Yep. Thanks. Lynn? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think it's very thoughtful and, and, and takes a very measured approach to how do we manage our resources wisely. And I was just curious, um, when you receive a request and it goes through the evaluation process and it's determined that CalSTRS would not have uh, the impact that's desired, it would not be able to address it at that time, would you communicate it back to the stakeholder or to a partner and why and also where they may go instead that they would have better results? Yeah, that's a, a good question because it does happen. And informally, we've been trying to sort of see whether this works in practice because it's great to have a, a policy and a framework, but it really needs to work in practice. We've certainly had a couple of inbound requests from some of our peers that we've sort of put this through a, a cut of this process. And yes, absolutely. I think it behooves us, you know, our, our reputation in the market and more broadly depends on people also recognizing that we're listening and, and hearing to the their responses and we will respond. So we have done that. We've responded to um, the, the peers that sort of came to us with this graciously and sort of explained why. And, and normally we find that, you know, if we can explain it in a way that says we recognize you have the ability to influence that better or it's not part of ours, we can do that in a way that shows that we're still focusing on certain priorities. So I think it behooves us to always be responsive. And I think my colleagues in our strategic relations team and beyond have always been very good at making sure that that loop is closed. Can I just add one thing? Um, I also think the idea that this stewardship plan will now be um, more broadly promoted on the website as opposed to in the past, the engagement plan was basically a deliverable that came to just to the board and wasn't, even though it was a public document, it wasn't meant for a wider audience. And the idea that now our, our priorities are better articulated to the public certainly helps because as as Kersey said, you know, we've had a couple instances from our investment peers and it is helpful where we can say, oh, thank you for your inquiry, but these are the priorities we're focusing on this year. And that's understandable that we, we know we have a limited number of resources. Okay. And I, I think to the point earlier, Harry, that you made about communicating the successes, I think that the handout that your team is doing now has been great. And I really liked the last couple of pages in the Green Initiative report that just kind of laid it out there. That was a perfect two-pager. And I think that it's really important to continue to communicate in that way. Yeah, we're really going to keep working on that, I yeah. promise. <laughs> Joy? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, so thank you, um, you know, Kirstie and Aisha in particular for your work on this. I, I really just wanted to um, comment and just say that I, you know, I, I really support the approach that you're taking. I think it's important to have a framework that we on the board understand, that the staff understands, that our stakeholders understand, that the markets understand about how we're trying to approach these really important issues. Um, I also just think that um, it, it um, kind of brings together a lot of um, concepts, both in terms of um, our, our priorities within the stewardship plan. I mean, the extent to which we are trying to have an impact on things like responsible firearms or the low carbon transition um, relies in great part on making sure that the boards of the companies that we're working with, um, you know, sort of achieve best practices in terms of their responsiveness, in terms of their governance practices, in terms of diversity of, of thought. So I think that they all, it, it comes together, and I think that that's, it's great to capture it in the plan. Um, the other comment I just wanted to make was I, I appreciated bringing into the policy um, the work that we're doing around securities litigation, because while that, um, you know, falls under the, the responsibility of Brian and the, the legal team, um, it, it really is a key element of how we engage and try to have an, an impact. So um, just um, kind of, you know, bringing together and, and um, putting into one document something that expresses how we have an impact on the market and how we can achieve outcomes, I think, is, uh, is important, um, and I, I, I support it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Bill? <clears throat> well, Kirsty, I want to commend you and your staff for uh, a, a terrific job, both on the Green Initiative Task Force and the Sustainability Report, their first rate. 
uh, very impressive documents, not only in terms of the content, but the presentation is very compelling and very readable. Mm -hmm. uh, it engages people immediately because of its, uh, well, it's a very glossy promotion. <laughs> uh, but I, I, and I also want to just say that I think setting up criteria by which we make these decisions and having specific criteria is very important, and I commend you for doing that as well. I mean, I think these criteria are spot on. Uh, but I do have one question about the inbound engagement requests, because I think that's sort of an area that, that uh, uh, you know, we've confronted that here, uh, you know, at our meetings when we've had people come in and say, why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? And, and we've had one, uh, uh, you know, that has taken up an immense amount of time of one of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, investment manage management groups. Um, and I would, I would suggest that if there is a, a, a decision not to follow up, that there's some form of communication. And if it's, if it's one that is, you, you, you know, it's a, these are policies. So would like to at least have the board involved so that we don't have any blowback, mm -hmm. you know, if it is an, an instance where, you know, it affects a stakeholder as opposed to a, you know, a, a colleague, yep. you know, another institutional investor, but involves a stakeholder to whom we have certain obligations. Yep. Before that communication goes out, there should be a communication. They shouldn't just be waiting out there for yep. an answer, and I, I'm sure you know that. But I think it is important for the board to know that before it goes out. And uh, I think, you know, otherwise we'll be caught by surprise on, on certain, at, at certain times. So anyway, just a yeah. suggestion. Very good point. And I think we do have, I'm certainly thinking you know, that 10 and 22 would be a very appropriate way. And otherwise, if it was another issue, direct discussion with you, I think, for those who we think might be most affected. So I take that on board very much. I'll discuss that with the team, clarify yeah. it, But I think that's a great Thanks. point. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Christy, to you and your team. Again, a huge amount of appreciation. And, and I do the 10 and 22 that um, your staff puts together. Sarah does that, right, and sends yes. it out. I, I, I think it is an incredibly useful tool for, to keep folks informed. It comes out every two weeks. It, it just gives a huge breadth of the amount of activity going on all the time in your department. So I, I, I want to really be aware of the, I don't know if we can go back to the sure. workload flow. I think that when we're trying to be really thoughtful and make decisions, I do think it's it's important to be cognizant of, of how we're giving you information and how the public is giving you information and, and how much is being done. And the more you're you're kind of running around responding to, yeah. to those issues, the less we can get to the, the meat of what we're trying to do. And I think that CalSTRS can be a leader in, as the chair has said, not segregating ESG issues, but having them be across asset classes. So I think I just need a better understanding of, of how the board can support you in, in really executing this plan and, and how we can hold each other accountable and making sure that there's not a lot of incoming. Yep. So That's great. And I'm, I'm hoping that if we get to the, the, the further discussion that we could have on a sort of strategic planning process, that would be so helpful, I think, to this. And, and we can maybe work through it on that as well. But thank you for you know, that offer. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So I, I just sort of wanted to reiterate um, Ms. Higa and Mr. Prisant's comments that that we really do stick to this in terms of, of how, we're, how we're putting workload through, especially yeah. given the huge amount of inputs that, that I think we all get all the time. So yeah. thank you for that, and, and thank you for bringing these issues to our attention. Okay, seeing no one else in the queue, I, I no, nope. Sharon. Um, I'm ready to, to move approval for, for those two items. I did, I did want to, I know you've heard our board talk so much about telling our story better. And I guess I just, I've been one of those people mentioning that. And I feel like in this presentation, it's, we've really beefed up our game. I think we're, we are. I know you and I talked yesterday, Kirsty, about some materials that we have in the works right now to, to talk more uh, in public around our strategies, around yeah. engagement and divestment and those conversations. So... I guess I just want to, you know, and I know there's a lot of staff behind you guys that have worked on this, but I think communicating clearly what we already are doing, what we're, you know, look, moving forward and thinking about doing, but doing that clearly and telling our story out there, because I think sometimes the perception is 
you know, if we're not divesting, then we're not doing anything in the space. And we all know it's a lot more um, complex. It's an art, as you said. Um, so I think as much as we can communicate um, facts about what we are doing and how we're doing it and telling our story, because I think we have a really strong story to tell. Um, so I just wanted to commend staff, and I would, um, I would move approval of items 5A and B. It's been properly moved and uh, by Sharon, <coughs> seconded by Gail to uh, approve items 5A and 5B. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the item passes, which brings us to 5C. Thank you, and which we'll have is a little investment. shift out and change. And change. <laughs> this is the investment belief uh, around a transition to a low carbon economy. Yes. I realize that uh, there might be uh, attempts to make some amendments or changes to the language. And if we're able to do that from the dais, we will. But if it becomes too cumbersome, what we probably do is just have an information item and have staff take notes of those amendments and then have it bring it back so we don't try to wordsmith uh, during idea. the item. But maybe we won't get to that point. Sure. So I'm going to turn over to Kirsty and, and Brian. And Thank Travis. you. And Travis. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll squish up. So I have, as you say, we are very lucky in that it's, I do quite a bit of the talking, but thank goodness you can hear from other people as well in the team. Both Aisha and now I'm joined by Portfolio Manager Brian Rice and Investment Officer Travis Antonioni as well, who are going to talk through these two other items that we've been focused on. So this one, as you can see, is obviously around a um, proposed low carbon investment belief. Um, I think what's really interesting and important to remember is that when we talk about our low carbon transition work plan that we obviously working with you in October at the BOF site and now sort of taking that forward, um, that that work plan covers all sort of three areas of our activities, both how we allocate capital in the, our portfolio and also more broadly across the Castor's portfolio, how we influence and how we manage relationships. So I just want to make that really clear up front. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Brian, who's going to walk you through um, why we're presenting this belief now, um, the language and the choice of language, and also what we hope this will now enable us to do moving forward in a more concerted way. So Brian, I'll leave to you. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Brian Rice, Portfolio Manager, Sustainable Investments and Stewardship Strategies. Um, so... As we were developing the language for this belief, I think there were really three kind of main overarching considerations. I mean, one was certainly to capture the intent and the, and the conversations that we had back in the October 2019 offsite. I think the second one was to be mindful of the existing investment beliefs and, and create a new belief that aligned and was consistent with those. And I think we've done that. And then I think third was keeping, be mindful this is a belief, keep the language at a high level um, you know, not get too far into details. I think if you look at um, uh, the preamble to the existing beliefs, it says that these are foundational frameworks for making investment decisions. Uh, so with that in mind, um, we did craft the language that you see, um, INV 125, uh, attachment one to this item. Um, in terms of language itself, uh, the belief, which is uh, the left-hand box, we wanted, uh, so we wanted to identify, again, the high-level risks, uh, physical and, and uh, transitional, which breaks down to technology policy. Uh, this is consistent with how we're uh, identifying, defining risk in the, uh, uh, our work plan. Um, I think in the supporting language, uh, paragraph one reflects the need to manage risk, which goes back to the physical um, and, and the ability to invest strategically, which ties back to the technology aspect. And then in the second paragraph uh, reflects the importance of policy and our ability as investors to influence uh, climate-related policy. Um, as Kirsty mentioned, there was some, or, or uh, Mr. Keeley mentioned, there was some uh, comments that we were provided around the structure of the investment belief language. I think it was a little bit confusing, perhaps. So I think we have a quick <laughs> fix, which as you can see in the slide there, we've, we've taken out oh, wow. a couple of commas and added dashes. Uh, like so so do I. <laughs> it was you were reading my mind. So uh, it would be our recommendation that that be uh, the language that is adopted for the investment belief. It's so great having teachers reviewing your material. Like, that doesn't Dana. make sense. Where's Dana? I was channeling her. Yeah. So our uh, hope yeah. is that we could ask you that about this belief to, to approve it and, and see how you feel about it or get your feedback. Are you going to share? 
You didn't wait for me, did you? <laughs> we weren't waiting. No, I said maybe we see if there are any questions we're, around. We're action oriented, Harry. We're moving okay. along. So where are we? Gail? Gail wants to okay. comment on Thank that. you. I, you know, I, I am I'm willing to, I'm happy to support this. I, I didn't know if you think it's necessary, given what we know, that it's physical policy transition and technology risks. Do you think that the, the word transition is, is necessary? I, I sort of defer to the group that knows more about this. I'm, I'm just cognizant that. The, no, she's suggesting adding. I'm suggesting, suggesting adding. adding. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. seen that too, Gail. Yeah. I think um, we could go down multiple. I think most people, when um, and the, the nomenclature seems to be that transition includes both policy and technology. Okay, so, so we could either address that two ways by sort of saying physical and transition risks, or we could break it down into the sort of elements of it. I mean, but it's a fair point. Transition is obviously very commonly talked to. Transition tends to include policy, technology, and other demand shifts. But yeah, yeah, and then I'm also. Just in terms of, um, and Ms. Paquin, I don't know if you know much more about this in terms of kind of the, the idea of helping the people also transition, that's also what I'm cognizant of in terms of that word transition. So the, the question of the jobs that folks have. Yeah, I hear that. But I, I'm open, Mr. Chair, it was just a question. No, I, I think it's, uh, you, your, your proposal would be to add the word transition uh, between uh, on line two? Yeah. Policy and technology. Oh, policy. Okay. We could substitute it, or you could put policy and technology in brackets. Have a conversation. So, so you, substitute, yeah. you substitute transition and eliminate policy and technology? Yeah. Fine. That's it. Without objection, that's... Oh, Lynn, see this? Yeah, this is okay. Oh, okay. There. All right, so we'll just put a little note here. We're not doing anything yet. We're not making any changes yet. It's a suggested change. We don't know if we will have support for it. Uh, Sharon, right. I was just going to say to the to the investment chair's point. I think. Yeah, go ahead, Sharon. I would just say I think we should have a conversation, an information item, and I would feel more comfortable sure. having a chance to talk more about that. So we're not wordsmithing because I, I think I can get into that. But I will say I think to Gail's point, I've seen that language before too, and so I'd like to have a little more time maybe to talk um, okay. to figure out what's. I think these investment beliefs are meant to not only guide us as a board, but to have the public kind of understand the overarching beliefs that we as a board through this period of time right now are saying, you know, these are beliefs that gu guide our decisions when we're sitting up on this dais. And I just want it to be something when people read it that it's clear. I recognize on PRI and other, I read a lot of different language. So I think we as a board just need to say, this is the language we're going to use. But I think to Gail's point, and I also do think that just transition language is the language I've seen used in, in, in labor organizations around thinking about you know, human capital and the impact on jobs for the future. Whether we want to include that explicitly or not, I think is a conversation that maybe you can have. So I would, I would agree with you absolutely. And I think what we try and do on the very second, the last line of that sort of supporting statement in terms of avoiding exacerbating economic inequality and related geopolitical risks speaks uh, to that. But I recognize okay. that if that doesn't feel strong enough, then, you know, there's a way we can, we can have a further discussion about that. But obviously yeah. recognizing the important role of the... Um, impact that it will have on the workforces. I think we try and capture that there, but if it doesn't stand out enough, that's for a discussion for us. And if, if I may, I, I think that's a good point. And I think, again, maybe it's a conversation we can have about how prescriptive do we want this to be, yeah. how detailed, because I think in that second paragraph up on the right, you know, it talks about carbon pricing and you're thinking about this from a policy perspective. How, you know, do we want to keep it more broad yeah. around policies versus getting into potential um, examples of those policies, yeah. if that makes sense. So again, I, I, I like that we're having this conversation and I think we should have an investment belief nine on, on climate risk, but I think we just need a little more retooling of it. So, and I appreciate the grammatical change because when I read it, I was like, yeah. So thank you for that. Lynn? So I, I also appreciate the changes that you made to the statement. And I appreciate the, um, comment by Ms. Miller about adding in transition, but I would not want to see policy and technology dropped from the belief because I think that those are two very important forces that we have to reckon with along with the physical changes. But I think that these, this 
idea that somehow, you know, as we're going through the transition, we're not quite there yet. And so there's a lot of risk during this process. We don't know exactly the timing of everything. We don't know the opportunities coming up. And I think that adding transition in, at least for the time being, it would be a good thing to do. Yep. And I also really appreciate the uh, text that you have on the right side of the column, both about the carbon pricing and public policies and technology. And I think that that was very helpful in understanding this belief as well, too. Great. Thank you, Lynn. To that, to that point, Christy, can you speak about the column on the, the, the right-hand side of uh, I, this, the belief, and then where does, where, does, where does that print show up? We have the investment belief number nine. Where would this additional language appear? In our policies, where would that be? It, it, it actually sits in the, um, if you look at, exactly, Attachment IMB. Two, we have the existing investment beliefs. You can see there's a little belief on the left-hand side, and there's a little explanatory paragraph on the right, and that's what we would propose to mirror. Yes, exactly, and some are longer than others, and we've tried to make it not too long, but, you know, put a bunch of stuff in there. Bill, um, you know, for someone who's really new to this game, um, I would encourage to, to uh, maintain physical policy and technology no matter what because I don't equate it with transition. Uh, you know, it, I, I really didn't know transition really included those until you articulated that this morning. So uh, for an outsider, mm -hmm. you know, looking in, that I think is very important. So I, that's yep. all I have to say. We can I think we can find a way to make this all work. <laughs> so I don't have anyone else in the queue. The only uh, suggested amendment, as I understand right now, would be the addition of the term transition. Okay. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, without changing anything else in the belief, we would add the, the word transition. Is there anyone that is opposed to just adding the word transition? So can I just ask the... What, it, wait, wait. Where would that fit? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Kirsty, where would you suggest the term transition be added to the belief? Because if we're able to capture this, we might as well try to get this now. If it becomes complicated, we won't. Investment risks associated with climate change, physical and transition, and then you'd have to have another bracket, which includes policy and technology, okay. will materially impact the value of CalSTRS investment portfolio and we can have a debate about whether we just want to say materially impact the value of Castor's investment portfolio and we can I've just been hearing that from legal advice here as well so there's a, a discussion around that I think that's how I would do it can you say it one more time more slowly and just, and just speak a little bit faster <laughs> just so I can hear it like I know I'm guessing speak slowly as well I'm really sorry um Investment risks, see I'm really trying, associated with climate change, physical and transition, and then physical and transition driven, which includes policy and technology, will materially impact the value of Calster's investment portfolio. There's a way we can put brackets around it and yep. allow that to show. Okay. Uh, Steve McCourt. Uh, Steve McCourt, in the spirit of muddying the waters. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would agree with Lynn and, and Bill that um, the, uh, somebody who's not as steeped in the terminology of climate change, uh, investment risks, um, I think transition is not as powerful a, um, a term as policy and technology. I would consider um, something more along the lines of investment risks associated with climate change and the related economic transition dash physical policy and technology driven will materially impact the value. Okay, I'm okay with you. Yeah, if it's just all the dashes. Yeah, that works. Better. So moved. <laughs> yeah. Before we have any no, Ms. Yamamoto has it. Yeah. Before you. No, I. I but I think. I just wanted to know where it was going to fit because we talked about transition, but where in the wording? So yeah, and I think yeah. and I think you captured it. So can you say it one more time? One more time. I'm sorry, I just one more time. Uh, investment risks associated with climate change and the related economic transition dash or hyphen physical policy and technology driven hyphen will materially impact the value of the Calster's investment portfolio. 
so the, the investment risks are physical, policy, and technology driven. Uh, the risks are associated with both climate change itself and the economic transition yeah. resulting from climate change. Yeah, that, that, that captures it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Keith? Thank you. I just had some questions. And some of it is, uh, and I apologize, some of it is really basic, but it's uh, this investment belief is going to tra affect the investment policies. How specific, how, I mean, we have all these changes in wording. How, how does an individual word or something could affect, or a concept could affect how an investment policy is first developed and how that policy is implemented? And I don't want to take up a lot of time, but it's, I mean, how significant is it? Uh, and secondly, after that, a question about some assumptions underlying this whole concept of investment belief. Sure. I might pass that to uh, Chris. Chris Salmon, something. Chief Investment Officer. Keith, I think uh, if you look at Investment Belief 8 on INV 128, um, that was the last one that was added. And if you recall, we did have a, a lengthy debate. Uh, alignment of financial interests. Uh, alignment of interest was debated exactly how broad that term meant. And it was qualified with the word financial so that it wasn't too broad. So the words do matter a lot. Um, uh, investment belief too, uh, that we view the public global public markets as largely efficient, but not completely. If we had not put that qualifier of not completely, the policy I think would read differently when it comes to the global equity and the way we implement it. So the words do matter. Um, and the theory behind investment beliefs, obviously we had operated for almost 30 years without a belief statement. We were really driven by the investment policy. It, um, I don't know if it originated out of, of Canada or the Netherlands, but it really started uh, outside the USA. The view that it's good for a board to have a philosophy or a belief statement um, to preface their investment policy. Um, so in 2015, the board took on the, the task of, of drafting up a belief statement, which sounds odd. You already have been operating for 30 years. You have policies. Now we're going to say what we really believe in. And it took time. As many of the board will remember, it was about an 18-month, almost a two-year process. Um, but I think it's already proven to be very valuable as the board has turned over and we have new board members coming on. We and the investment staff can sit down and say, you need to understand that our board, here are their beliefs in essence, their philosophy. If you disagree with it, um, then you need to raise it to the board because here's what they're going to operate from. Um, and in my experience, uh, 25 years ago, um, I had a board member who did not believe in capital market theory. Um, uh, he believed you could pick individual stocks and that's all you should own, be a, be a Warren Buffett. So we, we had a philosophical disagreement but I didn't have a set of beliefs to go back to to say, well, this is what the board believes. So you need to convince your other board members differently. And so as this board changes over the next decade, this will guide them. And it tells very clear instructions to the staff, the investment staff, as your money manager, what you're, what you're doing better be in, <laughs> in connection to these. So hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, just because some of the investment beliefs tend to um, be focused on different concepts, some of which is actually how you know, a direct um, um, application to the way you invest. If you're talking about justifying diversification, you know, which is number one, and the benefits of managing costs, those seem to be a little bit more specific to the investment function than something uh, where we're talking about corporate governance and ESG and in belief seven, which is more conceptual and pushes us a little outside of the specific implementation of investment, you know, and the concepts that underlie that. Um, and I guess the, uh, the, this in number nine that we're considering when I talked about the underlying assumptions, it's that when I, when I first heard about ESG, it sounded like, oh, we're going to change the world. You know, we're, we're, we're going to have an effect on the world as opposed to just being passive, oper I mean, operating within, but passively accepting a certain level of en environment. 
and a lot of the discussion about um, um, climate change, which is what we're talking about here, can be viewed in, in a broad context of, do we just accept what it is, we understand what, or try to identify what's going on, and all we're going to do is re react to it, and which I think is what number nine is sort of, mm -hmm. is, is kind of worded towards. We're just passive actors in a bigger thing, and you know, we can't do much of anything but except to try to anticipate how things are going to happen and what should we do about it to reduce the risks to in, in the types of investments we do. And yet ESG seems to imply that there's a, a little bit greater obligation <coughs> or perhaps a little bit greater um, action on our part that we are actually going to try to affect changes, that we're not so much passive but we are going to try to change or, or try to um, uh, implement some kind of change in the investment world or in the investments markets or whatever you want to call it in certain ways. And then, then that gets into a, a discussion that we're actually faced with in climate change is how, how far can we go in change? You know, some of the things we've talked about early that I noted on the, um, the effects or how do we measure success in terms of our uh, stewardship program is, is um, there were three things, uh, one of the slides and the ultimate was do we get re regulators to react, which to me is important and it, it is a necessary part. But then we've, we've then established a boundary about how what we can do. We're not going to go beyond that and yet sometimes we we talk about perhaps going beyond that. So I'm not sure um, if, I, I just need to talk to them later or something. Sure, and but maybe I, staff I, could just briefly speak to the concept of being active owners in passive index yes. funds. Yes. What that concept is about. No, but, but also the, the concept of us as a board. Yeah. I can talk to How far are we going to go? I mean, not, we don't have to decide it. I'm just saying that I haven't heard a discussion yet about how far we really can go. And it may be issue by issue. Or how far do we really want to go as opposed to just being passive player, players. I mean, that seems a oxymoron, but passive participants in a... Um, investment context? I would say that I think the way we look at uh, the whole plan of we invest in a certain way, obviously, and that's partly through, as I sort of bring you back to that beehive, the investment decisions that we make, that the guiding principles there are what is a good long-term investment. There is also the stewardship activities that we have, which is if we want to be able to pay beneficiaries over a long term frame, we need a sustainable economy which we're all operating within. Therefore, there are paths where we can use our influence as a large investor to shape the future that we want to see, both in the interventions that we can make with companies and the interventions that we can make with policymakers. So in this belief here specifically, the reason for putting in a recognition that policy also needs to support the world that we're going to be investing in, I think is incredibly important to draw in. And we have a role to think both about what we can do in our portfolio, but we also need to see how we can also work with other partners within the sort of global economy to shape that system. And so I see it very clearly as these two sort of avenues that we have. And as, as the chairman said, we even have an ability as a passive investor, whilst we don't manage those investments actively, we still own a stake in those companies and therefore we have an ability to shape and, as you said, be active owners of those companies and active owners of the markets that we participate in. And the power that we have, I think, increasingly is collaborating with global peers who are also taking this approach to the fact that if we're all going to be investing for the long term, then we're going to use our voice as collective investors to shape the economy that we think will both deliver returns and have positive social and environmental impacts. I, I want to just recognize uh, Bill, I think you have a comment you wanted to add. Yeah, I, I do. And yeah. then if we, we could try to refocus back to this belief, um, I think we have some language <clears throat> that we will attempt to approve. If not, we'll bring it back. Uh, and certainly I would encourage Keith and staff to find some time offline to talk in more detail around the complexities and uh, specifics around Keith's
questions and concerns. Bill. Keith, uh, the one thing that helped me understand this a little bit, because it, it was all new to me when I first came on the board, is if you look at the uh, page uh, 126, there is this legal framework that, it, that starts, it, it sort of, you know, comes down from the Constitution, what the uh, Calster's authority is and what is imposed on us. And the preamble of these beliefs states, these investment beliefs provide a foundational framework to all Calster's investment decision makers to invest in a manner that reflects Calster's unique view of the global investment markets and its vision for participating in these markets to accomplish its fiduciary goal. And so when we look at this investment belief number nine, we now understand that one of the criteria of making an investment decision is now to look at those risks for a sustainable return. And so it, it, it is a criteria by which we look at investments from now on, and it is part of the preamble of all of these beliefs. And it is what guides us and guides our fiduciary duty as board members here. And I think if you understand that in, in that context, and I always come back to all of these issues and I always think about fiduciary duty. What is our duty? And, and this helps us measure investment returns by calculating what is, how sustainable are these returns? If you have a piece of real estate that is on, in Miami, uh, how long is that, you know, and it's on the, on the coastline, how long is it sustainable? And so this is a, you know, an, an issue that we have to, you know, we have to look at. And I don't know if that helps, but I, I, I mean, I, that's how I see it. Thank you, Bill. Um, can we get back to the, uh, the language of the belief number nine. You can read that back to us as it's been amended. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, my colleague. <laughs> Investment risks associated with climate change and the related economic transition hyphen, physical, policy, and technology-driven, hyphen, will materially impact the value of the Calster's investment portfolio. Okay. And moved Second. and properly second. Any discussion on the amended investment belief number nine? Seeing none, all those, uh, Mr. Aylman, Chris. Right Sorry to be a fly boat. in the ointment. Um, the one addition I would make with in Kirstie's comment is strike the word will and change impact to plural. So it would be that it, uh, that those risks materially impacts the value of the portfolio. That way it's not passive. It might. It's an affirmative statement that we believe these are going to be risks. Okay. That was legal credit. <laughs> okay. I, I, would you like me to read that one more time? Please. Investment risks associated with climate change and the related economic transition, hyphen, physical policy and technology driven, materially impacts the value of the Calster's investment portfolio. I don't think you need the S. No S because, yeah, it's a singular. Materially yeah. impact. Thank you. As I was reading that, I was stalling. We said we weren't going to words that. Materially <laughs> impact the value. I'm just going to say it. How does that sound? Okay. It's just it's human nature, okay. right? <laughs> yeah, I think linguistically, it doesn't need the S. Does anyone need clarification? <laughs> How many times? No. Okay. So, as uh, amended, the Investment belief nine is before us for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Investment belief as amended has been adopted. I'd ask that just uh, someone have a copy of that distributed to each one of us at lunchtime so we have a hard copy in front of us at lunch. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much.